We just went over who we are, what we do. So, you know, this is our mission. We empower people to help save animals, the environment, and our own health through our daily food choices. Now I'm gonna start with a general approach. So what are some effective advocacy techniques? First, and I'm, I'm gonna go through these um, hopefully quickly enough so that we have plenty of time at the end so that everyone can ask questions or comment on whatever they're thinking about this. Uh, but in general, you want to lead with yourself and not be accusatory in any way. You know, this sounds kind of obvious, but begin by gently framing the situation in terms of yourself and your own values. So in a lot of these conversations, if people you know, ask me about well, why I might be vegan, then, or you know, if I am vegan, which happens a lot of times in the, in the classes we're speaking to, I like to not just say, oh, because it's horrible to harm animals or because it destroys the planet or because of all the workers involved that suffer. But I'll say, you know, I grew up eating meat. Um, you know, I, I am vegan now, but I wasn't my whole life. I grew up eating meat. I really liked the taste of meat. Uh, but at some point I, I started learning about these issues and I became a little uncomfortable with it. And the more I researched, the more I realized that, you know, I had a choice. I didn't need to participate in the system anymore. I didn't want to hurt animals. And it turned out that I started eating differently. I, you know, I cut out meat and then I cut out fish and then I cut out dairy and eggs once I, I learned, you know, that there could be even more suffering there than in the meat I was, I, I'd been eating. And uh, I felt really good. I felt healthy. Um, and I didn't see any reason to go back to those choices. So when I'm framing it, I'm, I'm just framing it in terms of me and my own personal values. So oftentimes it's really easy to become hostile or defensive when um, talking about any, anything controversial or talking about anything that, that is this important to you. Um, and that, you know, it's a, it seems as pertinent as something that's harming others. Like, why don't people get this? Why aren't you hearing, like, what I'm saying? Um, but of course, if you have a hostile or defensive reaction, it's never going to be persuasive. So there are, you know, if you, you go back to the, you know, Aristotle, one of the first uh, Greek philosophers, he talks about there are three methods or three things, three appeals you should be considering when you are trying to persuade someone of something. Uh, ethos, pathos, and logos. So basically facts or evidence, emotion, you want to be appealing to people's emotion, and you also want to establish character and show that you have goodwill towards your audience. And if you get hostile or defensive, that is automatically discrediting your character for people. So it's really important to, to never react, to never be reactive, but to always be very like thoughtful and calm and de deliberate. You also, it's also really important to give credit to something uh, about the other person's po position and show that you're really on the same team. So fact is that most everyone you're talking to, they do probably care about animals at, on some level. You know, they don't think that they should be harming others. They probably don't like environmental destruction. Um, so uh, you want to try to connect on those things first. And, and whenever you can, give credit to their positions. So agree with them on things. Say that you understand. Um, find points where you actually can agree with them so that they feel like you are on the same team. Also discuss how you came to your conclusion and then respectfully ask them for their opinion on what you've just said. So instead of just explaining things to them and expecting them to understand, create a dialogue, make this a conversation because maybe you can learn something as well. Um, so when you're asking respectful questions, you know, 
ask it about their, their own beliefs, for example, on how animals should be treated. The more questions you ask, the more you get them to state the things that you both agree on. Because most people's deeper values, again, are going to be the same. So for example, I might say, you know, I thought about it and realized that I didn't need to harm animals. I realized that I had a choice. And since then, I've been quite happy and healthy eating lots of other, de de lots of other delicious food. I even found a place nearby that made tastier tacos than I used to have. But I'm curious what you think. Since I know you don't want to harm animals, I'm wondering what other solutions you see. I mean, doesn't animal cruelty seem like something to avoid if possible? So you're asking them, you know, do they agree with animal cruelty? And of course, they're going to say no, they don't think it's OK. Um, and when you are speaking and you're keeping your tone in mind, because tone is going to be really important, tone is, tone is actually the message you're sending. Tone is the message that people will hear. So if you have you know, an, a judgmental tone or an aggressive tone, that's the message that people will hear. They're not even going to necessarily hear your words. The content is not going to be delivered. So one way that I think is very useful in mitigating your tone is to keep in mind that we are all hypocrites and that everyone is on their own moral journey and is in different places. Now, for example, you know, even, even if you are completely vegan and you try to buy everything completely ethically, it, it's only fair to recognize that if you are going and buying from you know, the centralized agriculture, agriculture system, you're going and buying food that other people have grown that 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 those products that those vegetables those fruits had to displace other animals they had to you know plow some animals in the process um you can't actually avo completely avoid any suffering in anything that you're doing and so recognizing that is really important also you probably have other areas in your life where you're not perfect or where you know that you could do better and for whatever reason, you're not quite there yet. It's really important to just keep that, like I, I find it really important to keep that in mind all the time. So, you know, meet people where they are and recognize that you haven't reached the end yet either. Also, it's really important just to be positive. So if you have a defeatist attitude, no one's gonna wanna join your team. Because what you're saying with your defeatist attitude, with your defeatist tone, is that you've already lost. So why should they invest in something that is already um, is already lost? This is a very common critique about vegans. People hear you're vegan and automatically they think, "Oh, you're annoying. You think you're holier than you know you're." You think you're holier than I am. You think you're better than I am. Um, so just, you know, another way to frame that last idea is remember that you're not holier, just perhaps aware that you could be more compassionate in this particular aspect of your life. So it's also completely okay to admit that you're not morally pure and that no one can be. So, you know, if you are choosing a more compassionate lifestyle, you're trying to be more conscious in your choices. It's not about eliminating suffering because as long as you exist on this earth, you can't do that, but it's about greatly reducing it. And when people bring this up, we're going to talk about how to actually communicate about these things more specifically. So also another general uh, approach is make your choice seem pleasurable. So social norms are really, really powerful. Everyone seek, or almost everyone seeks the approval of others and no one wants to be seen as an outcast or a bore. So if you make your way of being appear tedious or socially difficult, people are going to be scared away from that example. So for example, um, if, if I am going to eat with friends, I want to make sure that 
the that wherever I'm eating has a good option for me. That you know it's going to look attractive. It's going to smell good. It's not going to be iceberg lettuce uh, with you know some olive oil and vinegar and pepper, right? It's it's going to be something that others will will would want to have a bite of as well. So <clears throat> it's important that you maintain that. Even if you have to call ahead and find out, sometimes I'll do that. I'll ask a, ahead of time so that I also don't have to be that person who's saying to the waiter or waitress, uh, assuming we ever go back to that reality, um, that, you know, well, can you take this off or can you make this vegan? No one wants to seem difficult. So if you can front load that and try to take care of that as much as possible beforehand, or even suggesting another restaurant that's going to be more amenable uh, to your diet, where they will still be able to enjoy food, you can set that example. So also, at the same time, it's really important to respect yourself and to not apologize for doing what you know to be in line with your values. Because if people don't think that your values are that important to you, they're not going to take them very seriously either. So, um, you know, it, an example I've seen is you know, someone who they're basically 100% vegan and they want to be, but they go to someone else's um, party and uh, they don't want to be disruptive. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to seem difficult. So they'll, they'll have a little something that they might not otherwise, that they won't complain about the cheese and then they'll eat the cheese. And I'm not saying that you, they should complain about it, but the message that that also sends to people is that you're not that serious about your values if you won't even, you know, all, if you'll alter them just for that, that little bit of convenience. Um, so don't be disingenuous and withdraw into the position that it's merely your personal choice when you know that a major reason for your position is precisely because others are abused and killed for that choice, if that's the way you feel about it. So <clears throat> make sure that you, know, you are respectful of others and meeting them and meet them where they are, but you don't ever have to apologize for your values and you can stick to them and that's actually going to be more respected by others in the end. Also, avoid the topic while someone is engaged in the behavior. So if someone is eating meat or having dairy, that's not the time to bring up um, the fact that you know, the, the baby had to be ripped away from the mom in order for them to be drinking that milk. Uh, and if they want to bring it up with you during that time, just tell them that you would love to talk about it, but perhaps after dinner. And if you don't want to talk about something, going back to you know, not apologizing, you don't ever have to feel like you are the one that has to say something about it or has to educate some, someone else. You can refer them to something. You can send them, you know, tell them that, you know, I, I find what you're saying interesting. I think that you might want to read this book or read, or let me send you this article or um, let me, send you to this documentary you might find interesting. Maybe they're interested in health, so you could give them forks over knives or the game changers, right? Or um, if they are interested in you know, feminism, you could give them a work like you know, Carol Adams' Sexual Politics of Meat. So refer them to something else. You don't always have to be the spokesperson. So it's also really important to know the basic arguments. So even if you, you don't have to know every detail and, if, and it's also really important to maintain your credibility. So if you do not know the answer to someone's question, you, it's much better to just say, that's a good question. You're happy to look that up, but uh, don't try to give them information that then they later might find out is false because that's just invalidating yourself. So there are lots of good places to find these arguments. These books are a few of them. Um, also plant seeds and allow them to grow. So like I said, getting people to watch these videos, 
without, ha without them having to defend themselves to you, only to themselves, that's going to generally be a more effective way of approaching this. And knowing that you're probably not going to win the argument, they are probably not going to concede at that moment that yes, they're going to like go vegan and everything's going to be great. But the fact that you had a reasonable conversation with them about it, they didn't have to get defensive. They felt like they could express their opinion. You, 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 you can validate the person without validating their argument. Right? It's really important to be able to separate those things. Um, that they will come out of that feeling better about all of it and those seeds will be planted and they will start seeing things a little bit differently in the future. Now, I want to talk about the logical premises when you are talking about these issues, because there's a way to always bring it back to, to, these, issue, uh, to, to these premises that everyone in the end does pretty much agree with, uh, unless they're a sociopath or they just think that making others suffer is not a bad thing. So I just want to go over what some of these basic premises are that everyone will end up agreeing with and that is going to be important in the next part of our conversation. So one, suffering is bad, right? We pretty much all agree suffering is bad. Making others suffer unnecessarily is unjustifiable. Animals suffer. Eating animal products makes animals suffer. Eating animal products is unnecessary. Therefore, eating animal products is unjustifiable. And this is a logic that if you keep in mind when you're talking to people and you, you bring them back to these points through questions, they will then um, you know, have to end up conceding this. Uh, you know, we do this all the time in our conversations uh, in classrooms with our lesson. We're not forcing anyone to think anything. We're just asking them questions about what they think and their feelings and leading them back to these premises, which then ends up making them um, land on this conclusion. These are the other premises that, that are important. So reducing consumption of animal products will reduce suffering and destruction. I have the power to reduce consumption of animal products most of us do anyway. Therefore, I have the power to reduce suffering and destruction. Though it's very important that people feel like if they make a choice, it actually matters. So if, if they know that they have a choice and they can make this other choice and that it will reduce suffering, that they have that power, then they're more likely to do that as well. A lot of times people don't understand what their contribution how their contribution actually matters. Um, you know, for example, people will say, well, I don't, like, even if I don't go and buy the chicken, someone else will. It's, that chicken is still being killed. So what I like to point out in those cases is that, is how subject we are to social pressures and how powerful those social pressures are. So for example, I'll say, well, now, Imagine that, that you go to, and a lot of times I'm talking to kids, so I'll say, imagine you go to Burger King or pick another restaurant. Uh, if all your friends order the regular Whopper, when you get up to the counter, what would you feel most comfortable ordering? And, they're gonna, and most kids will, or most people will admit, they're, they'd feel most comfortable doing the thing that everyone else is doing. Then I'll say, well, imagine that one or two of your friends order the Impossible Whopper, right? The, the, or the vegan version, right? If, if you don't know what the Impossible Whopper is of this burger, do you think that you might be a little more likely to, to choose that? And everyone admits, yeah, I guess like if one or two people are doing it, I, I, I'd be a little more curious. I'd feel like it's okay. And then I'll give the inverse situation. I'll say, now imagine that everyone, all of your friends order the Impossible Whopper. And all your friends know about like, what goes on with the environmental destruction and the animals. And now, do you think that you would feel comfortable choosing the, the, to, to eat the cow when everyone else is choosing this other thing? And 
most everyone admits that, yeah, they wouldn't feel very comfortable. So the point is that these social pressures work both ways in getting people to understand that, that even them making that decision ends up influencing other people, which ends up influencing other people, is incredibly powerful. So now, how to lead the conversation. You want to ask as many questions as possible. When you tell people things, they tend not to actually hear them. They hear things that they themselves are saying. So you want them to say these things themselves. But people have lots of objections. So let's look at what some of these objections are and let's practice coming up with the questions that you can ask back to lead them to those premises that we talked about and the, and the inevitable conclusion that they're, like, if they are morally aligned with their, if, if, if they morally align their food choices with their deeper values, then they'll probably end up choosing something similar to, to, to you. So what are these specific arguments? I think we've all heard so, some of these. So for example, there's the intelligence argument. We're smarter than they are, right? We can build civilizations, we can build rocket ships, we can do math. What I would like to hear from someone now, I, I, I wanna open this up, what question do you think you can ask someone to point out to them that intelligence is not actually what matters, but suffering is what matters. Can anyone think of a, of a question? And um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll see how this works. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hi, this is uh, Christine from Pittsburgh. Hi, Aviva. Um, I would tell them that my compassion for someone does not depend on my estimation of their intelligence. So remember that th this is a question. How would you frame this as a question so they say that themselves? Well, I would say, um, what does intelligence have to do with feeling compassion? Okay. Not bad. Um, so one question you could ask here is, does someone's intelligence dictate whether we should harm or kill them for a pleasure or convenience, right? So for example, I'll, I'll usually make kind of a joke out of it. I'll say, okay, so say, say I'm a lot smarter than your friend, like your friend over here. Uh, does that mean that just because I'm a lot more intelligent that I can do what I want with them? Or you know, say you're you're a lot more intelligent than than your brother. If you're that much more intelligent, does does that mean that you can harm them for your own benefit because you you feel like it? Or is there something else that actually matters? Does it, is it intelligence that that that, that allows you to harm others? And it, most everyone will recognize. Well, no. Even if you're a lot more intelligent than, than I am, that, that wouldn't give you the right to harm me. So I'll say, okay, well, well, why not? I'm a lot more intelligent, so we're a lot more intelligent than these animals, so what do you think the difference is? And uh, usually you'll, you'll get that, you know, well, it, it's because they can feel things, because they can suffer. And so you say, yeah, I, I agree. So, doesn't that also apply to these other animals though? Because don't you think your, you know, your dog can feel pain? Like what would happen if you, if you kicked your dog? Um, so you can walk them through that argument with intelligence. There's also this common reasoning with the four N. So nat it's natural, it's normal, it's necessary, and it's nice. Anyone who's f familiar with Melanie Joy probably knows that about natural, normal, and necessary. Sometimes people add nice, which means like pleasurable. So here's the first argument that people say, you know, we're, it's the food chain, we're at the top. Or other animals eat animals. What question could you ask someone to bring them back to the point that that doesn't necessarily matter that we're at the top of the food chain? Uh, 
I'll um I'll take a stab at that. Please. Um, does that mean you would feel okay about a shark eating you? Okay, right. <laughs> right. So if 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 someone else were above us, like say an eight, right? Uh, one thought experiment is say an alien species came and wanted to eat us would that make it just okay for for them to do because they they have that power D does my having power over someone else make it okay for them to do what they want with me um if i have power over like my dog, does that mean I can just do what I want with him? So does the fact that I'm more powerful justify that? And the fact that other animals might eat animals, um, and we think that that ma makes it natural, does that actually, like, does the lion have a choice? And everyone will recognize, well, the lion doesn't have a choice, right? I can choose the falafel or I can choose the burger. The lion can't choose. So if I have a choice, do I, and I understand the consequences of that choice, do I become responsible for the choices I'm making? And most people will agree, well, yeah, if you, if you have a choice and you understand the consequences, then you become responsible. So they say, okay, well, then do I have a choice when I choose what to eat? Yes. So I have a choice not to, not to harm animals when I eat, right? And they'll have to admit that yes. And say, okay, so, so then, you know, why would I choose then to harm the animals? So a lot of times then people will say, well, it's pleasure, right? Bacon tastes good. That's why I want to do it. So what about that argument? Someone says, well, it, it tastes good. It's pleasurable to me. How, what kind of question could you ask them in that case? Anyone have any ideas? I have an idea. Um, this is, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. This is Tyler from uh, Bend, Oregon. Um, you could, uh, well, that, that idea that, um, that pleasure trumps all is, it's kind of that idea of relativism. And um, people like to say, well, everything's relative, but you have to draw a line in the sand sometimes. And, um, there could be some sociopathic people, there are, who like to hurt other people or kill them. And does that mean that they're okay to do that just because they enjoy it? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So exactly. K kind of along th those lines, a lot of times I'll, I'll keep it with animals. So I'll say, I'll kind of use humor and I'll say, so what if I grew up kicking dogs, right? My family had this tradition, we all kick dogs. And, and when I heard the dog's ribs crack, I get, I got, I get so much pleasure out of it. And of course I don't, right? But say, say I did, say I got a hundred times as much pleasure out of it as, as, as anyone here gets out of the tastiest steak. Would you say that the pleasure I get out of it is, uh, is, is a sufficient justification? And uh, people, People, most people will say, well, no, it doesn't matter how much pleasure you get out of kicking your dog, you shouldn't do it because it harms the dog. So then I'll say, okay, so then is pleasure a sufficient justification for um, you know, harming and killing animals? So that kind of gets by that pleasure piece. Uh, people say, well, it's normal, right? As long as we've been human, we've always, we've always used animals for food. What kind of question could you ask here? Hey, my name is Hila. I'm from uh, Pleasant Hill. And I would ask them, do you live in a cave and hunt to eat? OK, so yeah, it, it's a good idea to, to talk about things that we used to do or tr traditionally do that we might not anymore. So I'll ask, well, you know, there are a lot of things that we've, we've done for a long time. Like we've always warred. Does that mean we should continue to, to, to you know, kill each other in war? Or can you think of anything that we did for a very long time that we decided wasn't good anymore? 
you know, so in this country up until 100 years ago, women weren't allowed to vote, you know, uh, and it was like that for a very long time. You know, just, just because we've, we've always done something, like we've always oppressed different peoples, should we continue to do that just because it's a, a tr tr tradition or something that we've done since the beginning of our species? Um, and I think kind of that usually gets the, the, the point across because no one's gonna say, yeah, we should continue to, uh, to, you know, to, to oppress women or we should continue to, to kill each other in war. Um, so then they say, okay, so then I guess tradition or the fact that we've always done so, something isn't a good enough argument then, right? They kind of have to answer, no, it's not. Or that it's necessary. I think most people at this point know that you don't need animal products to be healthy and strong. Uh, here's an example of a, a famous vegan strongman, Patrick Baboumian, if anyone's seen The Game Changers. Um, or... So if someone says, well, but I need meat if, I, if, if I'm going to be strong, what, what question could you ask there? Where do elephants get their protein? <laughs> right. So a great one is, uh, well, you know, a lot of the, or if you look at a lot of the biggest and strongest creatures on earth, um, they don't eat meat, right? They eat plants. Like how does a, a cow becomes hundreds and hundreds of pounds and is a lot stronger than I am, even though I, I try to keep in shape, um, just eating grass and drinking water, right? So there's all that nutrition just in grass in order to make a cow. Uh, but another way is to, to point to a lot of athletes that are plant-based. So a lot of people know, you know, famous athletes these days who are plant-based. You know, you can talk about, you know, if, if someone's into soccer, one of the greatest soccer players of all time, Lionel Messi, uh, is, is vegan, you know, at least uh, during the season. You have people like Venus Williams. Um, you, know, you have the, one of the, the top male tennis players in the world, uh, Djokovic also has been vegan for years. And you can bring up a few of these examples and, and say, well, so if, 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 if these people or like Carl Lewis, when he you know, set the long jump record at the age of 31 was completely vegan, like if, if they can eat that way and be strong and healthy, then do you think that, that we can as well? Um, and so that kind of debunks that. Because uh, you know, someone could say that, well, I'm not an elephant, um, but they can't say, well, you're not a person, or that these athletes, you know, don't have. Uh, these athletes would have the same requirements as you, really, uh, fundamentally. So, no difference there. Um, now, can, can I can I just jump in? Please. please. Yeah, on on the comparison of humans to. Uh, bovines or cows and other creatures that just eat grass. I, I just find that not a very strong argument for for anyone who knows anything about biology, just because ruminants, cows have such specialized digestive systems to process grass into protein. And I, I, I just don't find that a super, super strong comparison. Um, to make in terms of um, vegan advocacy. I, I, I think that the athlete, the human athlete comparison is so much stronger. Yeah, so usually I give the athlete com comparison um, I, because comparing people to people is just, it, it's easier. Um, but sometimes it can be fun to throw out that you know, an elephant or a rhino is big and strong off of plants. So you don't necessarily need meat to be strong, but it's true, we're different creatures. So there are other arguments, relationship, moral contracts, for example. So a lot of people say, it, we have a special obligation to our own, but we don't have a special obligation to other animals, that somehow we are above them. Um, you know, in the end, you get through a lot of these arguments and then people will just resort to, but we're human. It, if, so if, if you end up asking, so what is fundamentally different about non-human animals that would allow for us to harm and kill them 
when we don't need to, basically for our pleasure of convenience, like how can this be justified? And the, they'll say, well, but we're human. You can't kill a human, you can kill an animal. This is just the way it is. So when people bring that up, there's a, another fun philosophical uh, thought, thought, thought experiment that is usually enjoyable to throw at people and ask them, which is the, the lifeboat problem. So say you have a dog and a person on a lifeboat with you and uh, someone and the lifeboat can't handle the weight, it's going to sink unless you throw someone off. Is it gonna be the dog or is it going to be the person? And uh, most people intuitively say, well, you, you know, the person's more important, you have to throw the dog off, off the boat. But then you reframe the question. You say, okay, say this is your, your dog that you love, that you have a long, a long relationship with and uh, that matters a lot to you. And this is some person that you don't even necessarily like. Who, who are you gonna throw off now? And a lot of people say, oh, I'll throw the person off. I'm, gonna, I, I'm not gonna throw my dog off. And uh, that gets to the point that it's not really about being human. There's nothing intrinsic in being human. It's the relationship. And so is a human life worth more because they're human? In the end, they're going to have to recognize, well, no, it's because of the relationship you have to them. Like you probably care more about, well, you might, you, you might care more about your family than people you don't know halfway around the world, but do those people halfway around the world actually matter less intrinsically? And most people will, will recognize, well, no, they don't. So just asking those questions um, and getting them to, to, to answer them themselves is planting those seeds. This is a little more obscure one, but sometimes people bring it up. Um, well, other animals can't enter into moral contracts with us, therefore we have no moral obligations to them. Uh, this is a little more technical, but this is, it. I wanted to put this in there because the argument from marginal cases is a really good way to, to answer a lot of questions that people have or a lot of arguments that people make. And this argument from marginal cases is you know, thinking about the marginal cases of, of humans. So people with mental disabilities, people who are senile, who can't be rational or enter into agreements, or infants even, you know, do these people then do, not have the right to be free from harm? Um, or can we use them the way we want just because they can't enter into these contracts with us? It kind of shows how nonsensical it is. Um, but also it's a good one when people bring up intelligence. So, you know, I worked it in um, special education for a little while and uh, I worked with pe people who are severely handicapped and uh, I could make the argument that, well, you know, I, I had a dog at the time and my dog de definitely was more aware and had more problem solving skills and was smarter in whatever ways that you mean um, by like human intelligence than a lot of these humans are. So does that mean that, you know, because my dog is smarter and the, these people were not, that I could do with them what I want to? And uh, people recognize that, no, that's not really the case. So just a couple more examples before I open it up. Uh, what about plants? So people bring up plants a lot. They say, well, plants are alive. Don't plants have feelings? And uh, there are a couple ways to approach this. One is, you know, I might ask if I gave you, if I gave you a, you know, a head of lettuce and uh, this and your dog or some dog, uh, who would you feel more comfortable stabbing with a knife? Probably the lettuce. Um, but there's also just the important fact to be aware of that even if plants are just as sentient as humans, even though they have no structures to, that we know of to be sentient and to be conscious, um, like a central nervous system, that it takes so many more plants to make an animal that then you're going to kill, that if you care about suffering at all, you're making so much more suffering in the world by eating animals, even if plants and animals are completely equal. 
So, you know, do they care about suffering? Because if they, they care about suffering of plants, then they should probably eat more plants rather than animals. Uh, sometimes people br bring up an oyster, which has no central nervous system. You know, there's debate on this. If anyone wants to stay on after the call, we could talk about the oyster. Or people will throw these kinds of things at you, you know, but do you kill flies and roaches? What if a bear attacks you? And uh, that's when thinking about those logical premises are important because that's a matter of, you know, are you, are you inflicting suffering on others, you know, for your own pleasure when you have an obvious choice? You know, if you have a roach invasion in your house, it might be difficult to live with those roaches and not be harmed by them in some way, right? So that's different than when you have a very clear choice. Um, what do you feed your cat? right, which is a problem for a lot of vegans. Again, that's a matter of choice. You know, the cat doesn't have a choice. So if the cat exists, you just are confronted with this very difficult dilemma. Um, but the point is, you know, when, whenever you have a choice, how are you going to exercise that choice? Can I jump in here for a minute? Please. Um, cats, biologically, are obligate carnivores. That's correct. Meaning they evolved to eat other animals. Mm -hmm. While you don't see lions digging up carrots. Uh, they just don't do that. And the same with your house cats. Um, so you need, I'm a vegan and I have cats and I feed them uh, regular cat food containing meat because that's what cats need to eat. Um, I know a lot of, well, not a lot, but some vegans who try to make their dogs and cats vegan. And uh, to me, that's cruelty to animals. And you can look up the American Veterinary Medical Association. They have positions on this. They have all the signs to back it up. So, so when, I mean, someone asks me, when someone asks me what I feed my cat, I will tell them I feed, feed them uh, Right. Animal, but, animal foods. Right. So the point of people throwing that question at you and, and why I brought it up is, is because it, it's a way to deflect um, uh, from their responsibility and try to discredit you. And uh, the point is just that, you know, this is a situation where you don't have a very obvious choice, right? The cat is an obligate carnivore. So when people throw that at you, you always want to bring it back to the choice that you personally have. That every time you make a choice, you want to like you you reflect on your own values and how you want to exercise those values and what kind of world you want to create with those choices. And the cat isn't really involved in that part of you know your, your choice making. Sometimes people throw out these religious arguments. Um, uh, you know, here are a couple of things that are just useful to have in mind. I'm not saying that you should get in a theological argument with anyone. Um, but if you consider the state of Eden, um, or if you look at the prophetic, pr prophetic passages in the book of Isaiah, uh, you know, basically the idea is that God gives an allowance, but it's not the ideal. And I say, if you're interested in this, I'd say, you know, feel free to go research it. If you want to talk about it in more detail, I find it an interesting topic. But basically, even in, re in religions, there's kashrut and halal, which call for slaughter to be humane. Uh, which is still recognizing the, the sentience and suffering of these animals. So <clears throat> what are some other arguments that you have heard? Um, what, uh, or, or questions that you have about what we've gone over so far? Well, I've heard um, other religious arguments such as uh, uh, some God has given humans dominion over the planet and part of having dominion means that we can do whatever we want. Um, it's, I find it difficult, if not impossible, to reason people out of religious arguments on any topic. Yeah, I um, don't have to. Because um, so I'm um, just for the, the sake of time, I want to make sure things move along and, and I should have, and you bring up a good point because I, I should have also mentioned that 
there are going to be plenty of times if someone is just being very obstinate that it's not it's not worth arguing with them about it. You can ask them questions, have them speak about things. A lot of times, you know, just have them like calmly lead them into, into talking about things that you might agree with. But also a lot of times it's worth it just to like say, okay, great. You know, I'm, let's, let's connect on so something else. Cause clearly like we don't necessarily agree on this and that's totally fine. Um, but it's because in, in, in some cases you will only like, if someone is very religiously entrenched in any idea, it's going to be very difficult to, to argue them out of it. And the point of, of all of this is not necessarily to argue someone out of their position at that time, but to get them thinking about it and creating a dialogue, creating a conversation that then might alter their lens so that they start thinking about things a little bit differently in the future because you're not going to be able to convince most people. But what you can do is get people to be more open to it, get people to be less hostile towards it. Um, and that should, and over time that should get like a more acceptance in society and you can get social change that way. Even if most people are not necessarily doing it, if they understand why they should, that's going to benefit us in the long run. So, um, but that, that, thank you for that. Uh, are there, are there other arguments that people have come across that they, they want, uh, like a question for? Yes. So the last argument I heard from a friend was, this is your opinion. Mm -hmm. And for every article that you can give me that says this and that, I can give a counter article that says something else. Okay, yeah, so in that case, what I would just say is that, um, you know, I, we don't even necessarily need, need to argue the, the, the facts about it. You're right, it is my opinion. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just think, I'm just trying to live as compassionately as I can. And because I realize I have a choice and I don't want to harm animals and I don't have to, I've just chosen not to. And I just feel better about it. So, you know, it, whatever you feel, you know, if you feel good about your choice and that's aligned with your deeper values, then that's what you should do. I like, because even just saying that is going to create a cognitive di dissonance in them that if they care about the suffering of animals, they're going to start thinking about it. They're not going to agree with you in that moment, but they will start th thinking about it. So just, again, frame it in terms of yourself and how you feel and what you're trying and what you're trying to accomplish in the world without being accusatory or without trying to then sound like you're convincing them. Thank you. How about um, the people who hunt? I live in a small town in rural Texas mm -hmm. and a lot of people deer hunt and that's their meat for the for the winter and they don't see anything wrong with it. As a matter of fact, they think they're doing a service with controlling the deer population. Right. I don't have a good counter. Sure, yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the deer population is obviously out of control because we've killed off a lot of the predators to right. and displace them to keep it under control. Um, uh, but, you know, for hunting, it's, it's kind of a, a similar thing, bringing it back to choice. I mean, one thing I will oftentimes uh, throw out when people say, well, what about like humane meat or what about hunting? I'll say, well, you know, if I were, you know, if I were one of these animals, like a chicken or a pig, I would definitely prefer that someone just shoot me dead one day than that I grow up, you know, being uh, tortured and abused in one of these uh, tightly packed uh, factory farms. So yeah, like, is it, is it preferable? Um, yeah, I'd say that it's, pro I, I would prefer it if I were that animal, but I'd probably prefer not to be killed at all. Uh, you know, it, and it, people who hunt tend to also have a lot of other values that are going to n need to be like shifted in order for them to feel differently about it. So <clears throat> that's, that's definitely a hard one. I just basically would go back to the fact of they, you know, you don't, you know, do you have a choice? Like, you know, do you, like, if it's not necessary 
to, to do and, and you don't have to, to kill those animals, then, you know, I, I, I just don't feel, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that myself and just let them ponder that because that's, that's going to be a hard one. I mean, there are, there are philosophical arguments you can make, but there will be ones that they can counter with. So does that, does that help at all? Yes, thank you. That's good. Any other questions or, or comments, thoughts? Um, hi, my name is Emma and I'm in Philadelphia. And I was wondering if you have any strategies or ways of posing questions that sort of highlight the fact that people consume meat um, sort of with this sort of willful ignorance about how it's made, like a way to highlight the fact that animals actually are suffering. And if you had to kill them with your bare hands, like you probably wouldn't. Yeah. Um, so uh, I do often actually, I, bring, I usually bring that up when uh, I'm talking about, when I'm having a d discussion about the, the workers that have to kill all those animals. So, you know, I, if I'll say, you know, I, what I realized was that I was having all of these other people kill these animals for me that I wouldn't have been able to do myself. So clearly, like, I, I, I would have realized that there's something, there's something wrong about that for me to do. So, you know, do you think that you, if you had to look the, look the pig in the eyes, and then stab her in the throat, it's, it can always help to use um, you know, uh, pronouns like, like he and she when talking about animals to, um, and to anthropomorphize them a little bit for the person. Um, that, you know, I realize I couldn't do that. If you were looking in his or her eyes, do you think you'd be able to do that? Um, and if you can't, then do you think that it's fair to make other people do that? Because then they end up with these jobs that, where, that they're taking because they don't have a choice. Um, these are low paying jobs. These are very di like emotionally and physically di difficult jobs. So, you know, is it fair to do that to these other people? You know, I realized for me that it wasn't fair to do to them. So that's another reason that I don't consume animals, animal products. Thank you, that's helpful. Any other questions or thoughts? There are questions in the chat. Oh, there are questions in the chat. Okay, I'm looking at this. Oh, and as a heads up, um, as like hosting a Zoom meetings with my classes, when you're sharing your screen, I think it closes out the chat option, so. Yeah, it, yeah, it does. I had to pull it up separately here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start at the bottom. Uh, oh, social media. Yeah, that's depressing. Um, because you don't have the advantage of, of being face to face. So you get people that are just ready to like lob grenades um, in ways that they would never do in person. So I would usually avoid those situations because those are also people just looking to argue. Um, on, uh, can you find common ground that you and the hunter do not agree with factory farming? Yes, I do think that it could be, it, you know, it, it, it could be a point of commonality that you, and a lot of hunters actually really dislike factory farming. Um, so you could agree on that point. Uh, how do we approach the question of what about milk and eggs and any, um, so for one way that I approach that is that I'll say, you know, I, I was a vegetarian for a while and then I learned that you know, there's actually more suffering in a glass of milk or in an omelet than there is in, in a steak or a chicken sandwich. Um, a lot of times that's in the context of like talking about these issues. And so I'll explain, no, I didn't know that the mothers were taken, uh, you know, the babies were taken away from the mothers 
you know, I didn't realize that all of these egg laying chickens were kept in these battery cages and then they're all slaughtered after 12 to 18 months, that all of the males are culled. Um, so uh, just that's a, that's a time when you can throw in a couple of facts that the people won't necessarily know about. Uh, let's see, the meat industry is legendary for its complete exploitation of its employees. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Um, so we definitely, at FFAC, we, we, we bring in, we think it's important to bring in the social justice aspects and what happens with all of the people that are exploited in, in the system through their labor. Um, other questions? Oh, people who say that they don't eat very much meat or dairy, so that's okay. Well, it's, I think it's important to validate that they, they recognize that this isn't good for them or the planet or the animals and that you're like, and, and that you think it's great that they're taking those steps. Uh, at that point I might ask, so I'm just curious, like what, it, clearly you recognize that these things aren't good, so what's stopping you from being vegan? I, and then letting them talk about it. Um, because they might say, well, it, it's, it's difficult with my spouse or, or if they're a kid, like my parents are, make the food um, or whatever it is, but let them talk about it. And then you can, you know, maybe brainstorm with them. Um, so people that buy organic free range, humane products. Uh, so I'll say, you know, I, I didn't know for a long time that, that these labels didn't necessarily mean what I thought they did. And so I thought I was doing the right thing. Um, and so I, I recognize that like, you're also trying to do the, something good for the animals. But in, in the end, I like, I, I realized that even with, you know, uh, organic dairy, the, the babies were still being taken away from the mothers, the cows are still killed after four to five years, that they're still a lot of times in these same situations and that I couldn't ensure that they weren't being harmed. And so I cut all of it out and I realized that I didn't need it and I actually felt healthier and, and better emotionally. Um, so are there, uh, there are a bunch of comments here. Uh, Oh, so bringing in COVID-19, which a lot of people are talking about now. Um, so I think it's really important to have the facts straight on this. Uh, so pretty much all emerging diseases from the past half century um, have come from animals. So they're called zoonotic diseases. And uh, when we encroach upon uh, wildlife, when we you know, deforest, when we um, have these, these factory farms near uh, the wildlife, these diseases can get passed on pretty easily. And this will continue to happen. Whether or not we eat animals, it will just, ha it, sh it would theoretically happen at a at a lower rate if we stop eating animals because you don't have these factory farms that serve as amplifiers and incubators for the disease spread and you um, and you don't have as much deforestation but as long as we're still expanding as a species we're gonna we're gonna have these problems um, okay so yeah so it it COVID-19, in a way, it's, we think it started in wet markets. There's still some debate about that. Um, but is there a specific question there that I can address about COVID-19 and the wet markets, rather than just covering it generally, because that could take some time? Feel free to just speak up. I, can I say something that's not about the virus? Sure. What do you say to other vegans who are the angry, in-your-face type of vegan? Mm -hmm. The stereotype 
that gives us all a bad name. Right. I happen to um, work with somebody um, many years ago, and she would just get in people's faces and yell and scream at them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. People like this are not, as you pointed out, people like this are not convincing anybody. They're pissing them off. Right. And they're making themselves look bad. So how do we communicate to other vegans, uh, people who have not attended this presentation, that the in-your-face simply does not work? So, um, you know, as hard as it is to convince anyone of anything, um, what I would, I, would, I, I, I would try to start with validating their feelings about it. So I know how it feels. I'm frustrated about it. This is why, you know, I do this work. Um, and so I, I would recognize that as say, I understand exactly how you feel, you know, in fact, when, like, after I turned vegan, I just started looking around at the world and thinking, how could this possibly be? Like, how are people so blind to this? That's the way I felt. Um, and then I had to also recognize that I wasn't perfect, that for many years of my life, like, I didn't see it. And every time someone had yelled at me about it, I recognized, like, I didn't respond well. Like, it, when someone yells at you about something, like how do you respond to it? Do you feel like that works for you? Because I've actually never seen it work before. And then have them just think about that and, and, how, and have them empathize or try to get them to empathize with someone who, with, with like someone who's being yelled at by them. So how did they feel when that happens? Um, and not and not in an accusatory way, ju ju just in a conversational way. So you know, I, I totally get where you're coming from. It's it, it's frustrating, but the more like I thought about it, and the more I talked to people, the more I realized that the way that people were switching over was never from being yelled at. And so I'm just wondering, like, when you've had success with people, how has it been for you? And I bet they're gonna say it, you know, start thinking about it, even if they don't admit it at that moment, because you're probably not going to get people to admit things at that moment. But how do they, you know, like, when they start thinking about it later, oh, yeah, this friend changed, but it probably, but it wasn't because I yelled at them. You could try that, see how it works. If, if they've been yelling for years, good luck. Oh, yeah, she's been yelling for years at work at least, uh, she's been officially reprimanded for this. She's been sent to anger management classes. Uh, she um, yelled at me because I wasn't, quote, vegan enough, unquote. Like, what does that even mean? So that's going to be one of those cases, just like with the people who are incredibly stubborn about eating meat. You know, it, it, it's not coming from a rational place. So even though you might philosophically agree with their stance, uh, you're not going to reason them out of their, their approach necessarily. You can have that conversation, open it up, and then plant those seeds and hope those seeds grow. That would be, that would be my recommendation. I mean, it, I know that it's it's past past five. I'm happy to stay on for a few more minutes if anyone wants to chat. Um, but uh, also, like you know, thank you all very much for showing up. I hope this was useful for you. Uh, you know, please feel free to get in contact. Um, I'm going to type my email into the chat if you happen to have any questions in the future. Let's see. Got to send this to everyone. Okay. I've also heard the art, well, it's not even an argument, really. It's just nonsense. But men are reluctant to um, recycle or care about the environment or decrease their meat consumption because doing so makes them gay. I've actually heard this before from several men and other than saying well there are plenty of heterosexual men who do these things there's nothing wrong with being gay you know and i know it's internalized homophobia and you know not rational all this other kind of stuff so that's something else i've heard yeah um 
there is definitely a difference between how men and women on average respond. Uh, a lot of times, you know, if it, having, bringing up other examples of, of people they admire or like, you know, professional athletes who are, you know, who, who are vegan um, and ask them like what they think about those, you know, just like, again, conversationally, it's always a conversation. It's about starting a conversation, making sure the other person knows that, that they're not feeling like they're not going to be judged. You're just talking about these things together. You're exploring this topic together. Um, you know, ask them what they think about these athletes or, you know, the Patrick Baboumian or Kendrick Farris, who was the only American weightlifter in the last couple Olympics who set world records, you know, like what do they think about those men that are eating plant-based or like people like Tom Brady, who's almost totally plant-based. Um, the fact that he barely eats any meat at all, maybe a little bit of fish, does that, you know, does that make him gay? Like, what do they think about that when they see those people and just see what they say. But again, the, they're acting very defensively. And so a lot of times just plant those seeds because those people are usually going, it, it's better to have someone who is hostile and aggressive about it because they care about it. And there's that dissonance rather than someone who's just apathetic. If someone doesn't care at all, you, you're gonna have much less of a chance seeing any progress in the future. Hi, Jesse. Uh, hi. hi. I just wanted to ask, um, thank you so much, by the way, for all the really helpful information. Um, I was just thinking about um, people in really underprivileged communities and, you know, who don't really have access to grocery stores, like more access to fast food joints than they do to grocery stores and how you would advise them um, uh, to sort of, yeah, have a healthy vegan diet or how to even find the food that would allow that. Yeah. So that's tough because there are, like, food access is a, is a real issue. Um, and uh, you know, there are plenty of us who are privileged enough to have access to good, like, good healthy um, like fruits and vegetables and all of that, but some people don't. And in those cases, giving people, I, a lot of times people don't necessarily know what they can eat. What are their options? So things like, you know, uh, teaching people how to cook, cooking with them, cooking for them, um, so that they start understanding those things. But it's much more of a process. It, it's kind of impossible to like just drop in and then give them an answer and then everything's good, right? Because there, there are all kinds of systemic issues there that are at work that make it really difficult. So, um, you know, food like food food justice is 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 a broader topic than just getting people to to care about animals and and environmental issues. Um, but I would start with that, just like making sure that they they know what out of the choices they have, what can they eat, what would be good. Um, where can they go for those foods? Is there a farmer's market somewhere in their community? Is there a CSA, something like that, um, that the, they, they might be able to gain access to? Thank you. I have a question. That's really helpful. Yes. So my family's from the Caribbean and ever since I was a kid, meat was really ingrained in our diet. So I tried to go vegan like a couple times and every single time I got very sick to the point where I was like, I, I can't do this. I tried it like a good two, three months. I felt like I was going crazy. I tried going to several different websites to figure out, you know, moderation guides. Is there any like tips you can give us to give on, you know, trying to find a better starting point? Because every single time it just felt miserable for me, especially losing beef and it was just like, mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So when, when you say you felt like, well, okay, so um, two things. One, uh, 
contact me so we could have a, a, another conversation um, a, a, about it be, because I'm very curious about your situation. I would love to talk to you more about it, but it's more of an in-depth thing. The other recommendation for anyone in that situation, if you can, there are really good like vegan registered dietitians, RDs, that um, can help you set up a diet because there might be something that you were like missing or um, you know, it, people, can, people can be vegan and be very unhealthy, right? You can be eating potato chips and drinking soda all day. You're not gonna be healthy, but there's no, there really is no known reason why anyone should not be able to ha eat a vegan diet if they're eating like a, like a diversity of like whole plant foods for sure. So um, it, we definitely need to look more at like your specific diet. And I would recommend anyone in your situation, like I said, speak to a, a vegan dietitian who'd be able to like help you with those specifics i'll definitely message you um is this um is this a uh, video going to be available for rewatch like recorded uh well we are recording it so i believe we we probably will be making it available um and yeah if if you, if you want to email include that in your email to me we can get that to you as well okay awesome thank you thank you All right, any other, any other thoughts or questions before we close this out? All right, well, thank you all very much. Um, again, like I said, I hope this was useful for you. And I did put my email in the chat, but it is J-E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, jesse, at ffacoalition.org. If you want to get in contact, I, I would love to hear from, from any of you. So. All right, have a good evening, bye.